So bookmakers, sports books, betting sites in general are pretty mean, aren't they? No sooner than you have a strategy that seems to work, then your stake gets restricted, your account could be banned, um, and you have all sorts of problems getting money out of them. Isn't it mean? Well, the fact is that there is a solution to this. Um, the, my experience in gambling markets was guided by myself being banned and limited many, many years ago. But ultimately, I did find a way through it. And the answer is pretty simple. It's existed for some time. And it's pretty much the only way that you'll ever make money by betting on sports or gambling. If you're interested in learning to trade on Betfair, then visit the Bet Angel Academy, where you have detailed, structured Betfair trading courses. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and click on the bell icon if you want notification of new videos as they're released. See, I've been through the same thing as many other people. And by that I mean, you know, you're trying to make some money from betting on a sport, whether it be tennis, football, racing, whatever. Um, you come up with something that you think is about to work, or you find some little niche that you can exploit, um, and then lo and behold, the bookmaker stops you from winning. And it could come in a number of ways. They could restrict your account. They may not let you stake as much as you wish. They could ban you, and they could invoke the palpable error rule. There are many ways that bookmakers um, can be pretty mean to you. And of course, in the age of the internet now, um, there's a plethora of information around your betting activity and other sites that you visited. And it's possible that a bookmaker could be tracking you and blocking you from, uh, or blocking certain types of people from actually using their site or to their full extent. There's been all sorts of stories, I won't go into detail in all of them, um, about the way that they do this. It may be worth me doing a video. We have somebody within the team that used to work for a bookmaker and he used to work on the system that profiles customers. And of course, you know, with Facebook, social media, all of these other platforms and various other things, it's very easy to build a profile of the type of customer you've got and whether you want them as a customer. Is it fair? Well, my experience of working in this particular industry had a couple of major setbacks. And the first one was when I was much younger, it's probably about 30 years ago. And I, the, the very first thing I did within the betting industry of any significance was I won the football balls. I came up with a process, a method for predicting draws, and then I had to find an entry process that allowed me to cover as many of those opportunities as possible. Um, and then I would just sit and wait for the right moment to deploy the strategy. And I did that on the football pools and um, I quickly realised that in fact, you know, the reason that I did it on the football pools is because there was a lot of dumb money. All of, loads of money went into the pool. Um, the pools company took a chunk of that out. And if I waited for the moment at which I felt the pool was going to be of an adequate size where I could possibly get a positive expectancy, um, that's when I put the thing into motion. But when that happened, uh, and eventually the football pools got trounced by the lottery, um, I was interested in doing it at bookmakers because it's a natural progression. You find something that works, why not try it with the bookmaker? And my story of the bookmakers was I developed quite a complex entry process. I uh, went into a bookmaker and said, would you accept this bet? And they said, yeah, that's fine. And uh, the system worked basically by losing fairly frequently and getting the occasional big win. So the bookmakers were immensely happy. Uh, these were high street bookmakers, I should add, were immensely happy to take my bet. And um, because they would see me coming in each week and losing money or every other week. And when it uh, paid out, I walked in there and said to them all, oh, hello, you know, I think this is one. And they took one look at it, did the calculation and said to me, oh, sorry, we can't pay you out. Now, I know what you're going to say here, but it wasn't like that. Because what actually happened is they said, we can't pay you out because it's too much money and you're going to have to send you a check from head office. So I thought, well, OK, fair enough. And then waited and sure enough, the check from head office came in. And I thought, fantastic, this worked an absolute treat. Suddenly there were visions of uh, sun-kissed islands and sun-seeker yachts and all of those sort of things. Uh, but they were very quickly dashed when I went back to the same bookmaker on the same high street and basically asked to repeat the bet. And they sort of said, no, you know, we've made a yeah, decision that we're not going to accept this particular type of bet. And it was like, what? Can you do that? And um, I immediately sort of decided, to, you know, I got in a bit of a strop and basically said to them, right, well, I'll go somewhere else. 
uh, in my naivety. And they went, okay, see you later, bye. Um, and off I went to another bookmaker where the same pattern repeated. And um, I, you know, at this point in my life, I didn't realize that that was the way that it worked. And um, I got a bit upset because I was struggling to get on anywhere and I started to have to go to different towns um, and all of these things. And it's interesting because if you look at the technology that we have today, um, you have uh, facial recognition technology in casinos, probably in bookmakers, but I found out that they actually had um, the ability to scan a betting slip and actually look at your handwriting and see if it was the same person. And um, I imagine doing this sort of thing now is much, much, much harder than it ever was. And, you know, there have been little moments in time when things have coincided to make things look pretty good. And there was a period with bookmakers where the um, sheets for the football odds were printed sometime in advance. And you could actually get squeeze some value out of that if there was something significant going on in the underlying market. Anyway, putting, putting that to one side, I went to different towns and um, I was unable to uh, get the bet on eventually. And it, and it became too much of a pain for me at the level at which I was at then to be able to do it. And I remember going to the Assistance Advice Bureau and getting laughed at, basically, because they sort of said, look, Peter, um, it's gambling, A, in the first place. And B, you know, everybody has the right not to do business with you. It doesn't matter whether it's a coffee shop, a clothes shop, a restaurant. You know, they can decide if they don't want to do business with you. There is nothing stopping any company from doing that. And, um, you know, that is the way of the world. So if you get banned or restricted, um, then you need to bear that in mind. There is no obligation that people have to do business with you. But also look um, at things from a bookmaker perspective. If you go into a casino, you're expected to lose money. Now, there are situations where that may not um, occur, but generally over the longer period, casinos will make money. And casinos also have the right to ban you. Like I mentioned, they have the spatial recognition technology, which I've seen demonstrated. And, you know, they are looking for people that are trying to bend the rules, and, you know, uh, sort of look for little flaws within the system that they may be able to exploit. But ultimately, they're there as an entertainment industry. So you go into a casino expecting to lose, um, but, and their job is to sort of balance that off with the thrill of a win, but ultimately losing over the longer term. And, you know, if you cheat, then you will basically uh, not be allowed back into the casino again. And sort of bookmakers are fairly similar ca to casinos in that respect, because, you know, they, the whole thing is structured against you. If you bet into the Grand National, um, you'll be betting into a book of about 150%. And as a consequence, you would be expected to lose over the long term. You may win, but you're probably going to lose. And that's fair enough, because that is the way that their business runs. That's the, the fee that they charge effectively. Um, but if you're a little bit smart, uh, then you can probably trim the odds slightly more in your favour. But ultimately, they are there to make money. Um, they're not there as a cash point machine for for anybody that chooses to be so, um, you know, that you, you go into that with eyes wide open, knowing that that is going to happen. And when you look at things like restrictions, you know, they've been in place in casinos for years. Uh, the number of decks that you use in blackjack um, or the, the table or house limit uh, that you have on certain games. You have a minimum bet. That means you have to put a certain amount in. Otherwise, it's not worth them doing it. But you also have a limit that basically means that you can only bet up to a certain amount. So it's impossible for you to wade in, apart from perhaps Vegas, with a million pound and say, right, I'll have a million pound on black because the casino could go bust. So as a consequence, casinos have limits on them. They do ban customers. In the early part of my career, I remember card counting and somebody who was experienced at it was basically uh, not only teaching me to card count, but also to mask the fact that I was card counting because card counting is banned in casinos. But even then, a lot of casinos use multiple decks and various other things to restrict your ability to be able to make money through blackjack. That's just the way that it works. So after that experience um, of effectively being banned or restricted, I couldn't find anywhere to place bets because nobody would accept my bets. I just thought, well, you know what? I'm wasting my time with gambling. And, uh, you know, th there's just no way that I can win in this particular scenario. So I sort of waved goodbye to it ultimately and then moved into financial markets. That was what catapulted me into financial markets, the biggest casino of the lot. 
And there I stayed. I didn't anticipate coming back to the gambling industry. However, by, you know, a, a number, a, a series of unrelated uh, events, I learned about betting exchanges and the online or the trans transformation of the betting industry to an online space. And that got me interested again, because when I heard about betting exchanges, I thought, well, that sounds great because you're betting against somebody else. You're not against a bookmaker. And therefore, in theory, you should bet a win. It's just me against everybody else. And if I'm better than everybody else, I will win. Um, so, yeah, that sort of drew me back into the gambling space from the financial markets. And at first, I didn't think about it too seriously because I wasn't expecting it to be as big as it is now. You know, the uh, individual markets turn over tens of billions a year on betting exchanges. But I sort of, you know, was curious and thought, you know, I've got an opportunity here. Let's see what happens. I've, I've told you this story many times before. But curiously, the first thing that I did was I started arbing. So I would basically, you know, it's like sort of you would see with match betting nowadays, but I would go and find an opportunity and then lay it off on the exchange. So I'd phone around bookmakers, go onto their websites and go into shops, just try and find mispricing in the market where they'd got it slightly wrong. I'd take up the bet with the bookmaker, the sports book, or whoever would take my bet. And if I could get that bet on, then I would lay it off on the exchange. It was a really simple process. Um, nothing too complicated about that. And that was how I started on betting exchanges. That was the most obvious opportunity to me. I could go out and back Tiger Woods at 20 to one, lay it off at 15 on the exchange and net the profit between the two. You know, simple. Apart from, you know, it was designed to be a risk-free transaction because when you placed a bet with a bookmaker and laid it off on the exchange, the two would counteract each other and you'd net the profit between the two. It's like a very early, simple version of trading. But I soon started to run into problems because bookmakers were beginning to welch on the bets. They would basically say, oh, yeah, we offered you 125 to one, but in fact, it was a mistake. And, and of course, you just laid it on to the exchange and it's like, Ugh! suddenly you'd have this massive liability on the exchange and no covering position on the other side. And generally, it was few and far between. But, you know, if it's a, such a simple strategy that anybody can execute it. And also the, the problem that you find is when there's a mispricing in the market, everybody plows into it. This is probably one of the issues that match betting is going to face is the cost of running a position uh, that can be exploited is a marketing cost. And, you're, you know, you, every company has to pay a, a cost per acquisition and match betting generally drives new customers from a numbers perspective, but they don't stay around for long. So the um, average revenue per customer is incredibly low for people that do match betting. And therefore, from a marketing perspective, it makes no sense to do those offers if they get exploited. That's one of the key issues within the match betting industry. Anyhow, yeah, I had one particular instance where I backed something at 125 to one, laid it off on the exchange at much shorter rods, and the bookmaker uh, couldn't pay out. Uh, they initially refused. We went through a lot of debate about how and why um, and stuff like that. And I actually ended up going to the Metropolitan Police, the Vice and Gaming Squad and, um, you know, discussing matters with them and stuff, because when they refused to pay out, I obviously sort of blew my lid because I had a massive liability on the exchange. And I started digging around to see if other people had been affected by this company. It turned out lots of people had. And that's how it ended up at the um, at the Metropolitan Police and eventually at the Serious Fraud Office as well. But the problem from both those perspectives was, I remember the SFO saying to me, oh, we only really deal with cases that are over a million. So if you can present us with a million pounds worth of losses, then we'll consider it a serious fraud. Other than that, it goes to the police. But when you have a gambling debt, back then, I think the laws changed since then, it wasn't legally enforceable and there were all sorts of complications. So it was really hard to resolve those sort of issues. So on this particular occasion, I basically went to the office of this bookmaker in London, um, snuck in, sat down on the guy's desk who I'd been speaking to and waited for him to turn up to work. And lo and behold, a little bit later, I did actually get a payout because I think he thought, well, I'm not gonna mess with this guy because he's gonna be the biggest pain ever. I'd rather just pay him off and, and fob off loads of other people. Now, the, the interesting thing is, the thing that I learned from that era was that there were a lot of, you know, bookmakers are in various different grades. And, I, and I've learned subsequently as well in my time within betting exchange markets is there are actually some really good 
independent bookmakers, real bookmakers who will take real risk. Um, and you can phone them up and say, I want 20 grand on this guy at whatever, and they will, they will make a judgment on it. But typically where you get a lot of these horror stories are the sort of shady uh, bookmakers that are, are small and um, sort of discreetly tucked away somewhere. And the one that I got caught out on was a, a, a bookmaker that only had an online presence. They had a license, um, but they were running a really dodgy book. And so basically they were expecting and wanting people to churn their money through the book until they eventually lost all of it. And they didn't want people like me arbing positions. And when they had to pay out on a very large position, um, they didn't want to, and they were trying to use every trick in the book to limit it. But that's how they were generally running their business at that particular moment in time. Um, it wasn't uh, particularly um, ethical. And they were just hoping that eventually they would, you know, pay some people out on the basis that lots of other people lost money. And they were generally pricing the book competitively to drag that money in. And that's the key problem that you have with match betting, with arbing, all of those sort of things, is you could get caught out by one of those things. And when that happens to me, I just thought, well, okay, you know, I've been burnt here. I'm not going to be burnt again. So uh, let's just not go there. Let's focus on some other aspect. And that was pretty much how trading was born on the exchange. Yeah, a few days after that incident happened, I basically um, started doing trading a lot more seriously. I'd already had the concept before because I thought rather than just laying a position on the exchange, why don't I back it at the same time? And then the two, if they net each other off, will profit. But I just thought, well, that's a crazy idea. That's never going to work. But lo and behold, it did. But the thing and, you know, one of the main points on this particular video is that this problem has been around as long as I can remember. Uh, right from the very early days in my career, sort of 30, 35 years ago, um, to where we are now. And the fact is, it's it's part of the business model. It's not a structural problem within the market. Um, that is the way that it works. You can't go into a casino and demand that you get paid out. You can't put unlimited amounts of cash down. And if they make a, a mistake, then they have the right to correct that mistake. So if you base your entire proposition upon that, you're probably going to run into problems sooner or later for one reason or another. And it was all the things that I've described so far that put me off from using bookmakers. I haven't opened a bookmaker account for many, many, many years. And my focus has been entirely on using betting exchanges. Because, you know, th that's the solution. If you want to win money in the longer term and you want to make sure that your bets are honoured and you want to make sure that you can put large stakes on uh, as large as the market will take, use a betting exchange. You're going to get better odds. You're going to bet against somebody else. If you're more skillful than them, you will win over the long term. There are a variety of people on the other side of the book, but ultimately it's a game between you and them. And if you look at a market like the Grand National, if you're betting with a bookmaker, you'll end up betting into a book of about 150%. So you're going to lose your money very, very quickly. On an exchange, that's going to be 101%, somewhere around there. It's going to be really small. Um, I mean, you also get the opportunity to, to back or lay. You can bet for something, you can bet against it. Uh, you can only do that on an exchange. I'm surprised bookmakers haven't offered people the opportunity or derivatives thereof. Um, but you can also set your own odds. If the odds aren't available that you want, just create your own. You're not obliged, as you are with a bookmaker, to take the odds that you are, are given. You can go in and say, well, I don't think that's three to one. I think it's probably four to one. And you can stick that in the market and wait for the market to match it or not. Um, you won't get uh, the palpable rule error simply because the bets, when they're matched on an exchange, get matched instantly. And that's it. You know, the market will be settled at some point in the future. But if you take a bet, you know, it, it doesn't get reversed. Nothing gets changed, apart from in very exceptional circumstances. But the general rule of sum is if you back 500 quid at four to one and you think it should be at three to one and it comes in, you will get paid out. Because on an exchange, you have to lodge that liability up front. And when it's taken, that's when the contract is struck. You don't get restricted. You don't get banned. And of course, you know, the biggest benefit of uh, the betting exchanges is that you can win whatever the result regardless of who goes on to win a, an event, whether it's a horse race, a tennis match, a football match. You know, trading has completely transformed the number of opportunities that you've got um, on uh, betting markets and sports betting, simply because the exchange allows you to do all of the things that you couldn't do with a bookmaker. Um, you go down that list of all of the problems that you could potentially have if you're trying to make money by gambling or through sports betting, 
or with a traditional bookie, and they're all knocked down one by one on the exchange. And that's how I ended up using the exchange, simply because um, over many, many years, it's the only way, if with my sporting knowledge and my ability within the market, that I've been able to make money. I can put through millions of pounds, um, and it's just my judgment against yours. If you think you're better than me, then take my position in the market. And you're not obliged to either. You can do so many clever little things on the exchange that it's the perfect solution to all of the problems that you have with a traditional sports book or bookmaker. So when you see somebody complaining about an issue that they've had with a bookmaker or a sports book, you know, the answer is really simple. Get them over and using a betting exchange. It completely changed everything that I did 20 years ago. And I'm absolutely amazed that when people complain about bookmakers, they don't just say, so use an exchange. Because ultimately that's the solution. If exchanges were more prevalent and better known and people were using them more, then it, I'm pretty sure that bookmakers would have to change the game. But as it is, I'm absolutely astonished 20 years after we started that all of the large corporates with their websites and bookmaking apps and stuff like that are still around. And still we have all of these particular problems because at the end of the day, um, the exchange is the solution to most of these and there's no reason why you shouldn't use it. So if you're getting banned, restricted, limited, palped by a bookmaker, use an exchange.